Hi guys, my name is Arian Pravin. And I'm Brandon. And today we are going to be interviewing Sana from Year 12. So Sana, you are currently the president of the Physics Society. Mm -hmm. And today we are going to be interviewing Sana about her troubles with ASD and her journey to one, getting diagnosed with it, and two, helping families whose children also have ASD. Yeah. So Sana, tell us a bit about your blog. I am the leader and founder of my blog, Inside My Heart, which is, which is co-run by a charity that I work with, Girls on the Spectrum. It's all about, while well, I'm not diagnosed yet, I'm still in the process of getting diagnosed. It's all about the struggles that you face as a teenager that most probably has ASD. So I talk about a lot of things like how I'm treated as a kid compared to other people my age, a lot of things about how I struggle with friendships and maintaining relationships, other things like how making plans is really difficult, all the way to things to general things like stress and how dealing with it is really difficult. In lockdown, in year eight, I was like, well, it's been Four, it's been like 13 years of my life and I still can't make friends properly so what's wrong with me I have all these things and I was like okay from my research I've concluded that I most probably have ASD so I went to my mum to talk about it she agreed with me and we agreed to start the process we started the process in year nine which was still in lockdown and it's been going on for about four years now three four years round about um but I'm I've done all like the preliminary stuff right now. We're just waiting for my assessment. The assessment is like a five hour thing. Where, five hours? Yeah. So wait, what happens during those five hours? So during those five hours, they'll ask you, and because I'm under 18, they'll ask my mum as well right. and my dad um, about what I was like as a kid. They'll ask me questions about what it's like to be me in the world. And they'll, uh, they'll ask you to complete certain tasks like one thing that comes with ASD specifically in very young children is lack of imaginative play, which means that they can't really play properly with other young children, which is what I struggled with as a kid. So even though I am 17, they will most probably treat me like a child because there's, I'm still in that really weird gap where it's not adult, but not kid. So depending on that, it's like five, sometimes it runs to 10 and then it takes like three to four weeks to get a final result of what it is. So Sana, what are the, like, some of the stigmas that you face as um, with this condition? So, uh, like I said, I'm not fully diagnosed yet, but one of the things that I have talked about on my blog is how I'm often treated like a child. So I have a very high-pitched voice, and um, the way I dress is quite like a cartoon character, because I love bright colours, and you know, have Peanut with me, because with me everywhere, he's a little emotional support toy. Um, all that stuff means that most of the time I'm treated as a child compared to like you guys uh, by a few of our teachers even though they don't mean it they're not doing it on purpose it's just sometimes I want to be treated like everyone else and not like a little kid another thing is I really don't like it like um when you're like people talk to you on the street for no reason uh, I'm so like just coming up to you yeah. saying hi it, yeah, I can't deal with it properly yet. Oh, right. So because I script the majority of social situations in my head, I have sort of like little commands that run for everything, like a little subroutine here and there, you know, a little <laughs> computer science, a little subroutine that runs every time I encounter a certain situation. And when they're unexpected, I can't really plan it. So those sort of things are kind of odd. And then there's like a lot of people think I'm really rude and aggressive because I come across as very direct. Uh, for what it's worth, we think that so far you've been very kind answering our questions. I also wanted to ask, your blog is called Inside My Heart. What came about that name? How did you decide on it? So when I started my blog, I wasn't really sure what to call it. Uh, me and my mom were brainstorming, brainstorming ideas and it, we wanted it to, it's very personal. The whole point of the blog is that I'm completely vulnerable on it. Everything that links to that topic of the week, I write about in that blog. It's completely open. It's completely my experience. And I thought the best way to explain it is that people are looking inside my heart. Uh, AS self is a, it's a neurological disorder which affects your brain, but it also affects the way that you form emotional connections. So I thought that the best way to call it would be inside my heart. It's showing people a little glimpse into my world. Right, so how you are inside. Yeah. That is a really smart way to go about that. Thank you. Yeah. So Sana, do you have any like favorite blogs and like your 
So my favorite post that I did was the one that got the most interaction from other people. I did one on communication and talking. So the one, so there's a difference between communicating effectively and the difference between just talking. As you can tell, I really love to talk. Uh, talking is the way I get stuff out into the world because there's so much going on in my brain all at once that I just needs to go out. Well, communication needs everything from verbal communication to non-verbal communication, like body language, which I can't really read properly. So I talked about how there's a difference on that and people think that I'm like, um, that one of the misconceptions is because I, I talk a lot and because I'm able to, uh, it, convey information very easily, like convey facts and figures and whatnot to other people, that I must also be really good at communicating, but I'm not. I still can't really communicate properly. Things like eye contact, body language, facial expressions throw me off all the time. And that blog resonated with a lot of people. I got a lot of messages saying that, thank you so much for explaining this. I finally get why my daughter isn't doing as well as I think she's doing and yeah even like related to the blog but i did do a seminar with the people that run the charity over the summer where i helped girls with asd prepare for secondary school so you know that really weird transition between year six and year seven i went and talked to them about that and after it i had someone come up to me uh, it was actually someone's mum. she told me that her daughter had said does that girl actually have ASD? Because I want to be just like her when I grow up. And that really resonated with me. And I think about that every day. And her mum told her that um, I'm still going through the process. But yeah, it's like someone wants to grow up and be me. That How must be wild. awesome is that? <laughs> so I'm guessing you must get like a lot of satisfaction from this kind of like trying to explore and like tell other people how you feel because there are other people that feel exactly the way you do. Yeah, the thing is, I feel like um, growing up, I felt really alone. I felt like no one really got what I was going through because I didn't know how to, to talk to other people about it. I didn't even know how to name it. So like this, it gives people a chance to actually understand that they're not alone in all this, that there is someone else that's, you know, that understands going what they're going exactly through. Yeah, yeah, that understands what they're going through. So. There are a lot of stereotypes around ASD. People think that, like you were saying, they get treated like a child a lot. So, but even like us, you have your own real world aspirations that a job or a career. So what career are you trying to pursue? So um, two of my major special interests are computer science and physics, right. which I'm very lucky are also very academic interests. Uh, because of that, in the future, I really want to go into quantum mechanics and its effects on computer science. So, um, that's like one really big part of my special interest and i feel like although it's like i think over 50 percent of autistic adults that don't have a job or are unemployed because the way the job industry works isn't really built for neurodivergent people but however that does mean that the people at the top of their careers like let's say like, let's say Alan Turing, for example, he was the highest like, decoder guy. Yeah, yeah the broke highest, the Enigma code. Yeah, he broke the Enigma code. We're talking about computer science today. Um, he was most probably on the spectrum. And people think that this obsessive need I have to learn everything is such a bad thing, when in reality, it's kind of like a benefit in certain situations, like when it comes to research. I, that, that I use it all the time in FISOC to research topics, things like that, because I can get so involved in something that I can ignore everything else. Mm. That doesn't mean it's always a good thing, because I have forgotten about multiple things when I've been really fixated on something. So like, even basically like, taking care of yourself becomes such a burden when you're so fixated yeah, on a be... topic. So you said that with neurodiver neurodivergent people, there's sometimes uh, problems that arise when trying to look for a job. Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of problem specifically? Um, like I said, I haven't really been looking for a job right. because school takes a lot of my time. But uh, one of the main things that is difficult for neurodivergent people is the interview. That's really interesting. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what? 
Ini kata, biar kena kata salam. Ada tu jutaan tu. My son.